Today I want to talk about what it means to be a functional part of the body of Christ. Now we're all parts of the body of Christ, amen? But the, the goal really is to become a functioning member of who God created us to be. We are a part of his body. If we've been saved and born again, how many have been saved and born again? If you've been saved and born again, you are a part of his body. And it may be, you know, whatever position God has ordained for your life, you are a part of his body. And in order for his body to work, guess what? You have to function in that place that he has given to you. And so when I, meet, when I say becoming a functioning part, you not only realize you're a part of the body of Christ, but you understand what your place is. You understand your position and what it means to be designated in the place that God sets you. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 18, that's not on the slide because I put it in later, it says, but now God has set members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. That's a very important scripture because it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> it's according to what God has pleased. How many know in Psalms 139 that God says, I am intimately acquainted with all of your ways. He says, I created you, I formed you in your mother's womb, all your days were written before now. And so your days have all been written. And so the important thing is for us to understand is that when we get saved, when the Holy Spirit enters our life, we enter into the predestinated plans that God already has for us. That doesn't mean that he predestinates who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. It happens after you enter into that place where you make the choice and you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you enter into predestinated place. And do you know what the outcome is that we're all going to be conformed into his image from glory to glory? Amen? And sometimes it takes us a while to figure out what that is. I remember when I was a young Christian in Bible college, I had a job, and I was out in the yard working with this other employee that day, and, uh, you know, being a young Christian filled with the Holy Spirit and getting the word pumped into me every day, I was on fire. I wanted to witness to I was telling this guy, I was trying to tell him about Jesus. But you know what happened? I began to tell him all of this heavy duty stuff I was learning in Bible college. And he turns to me and he says, You know, I don't care about all that stuff. I just want to know about Jesus. I just want to know about Jesus. And so what I'm trying to say is we, we go through different stages in our life thinking that we are this thing or that thing or where we're supposed to be. At that time, I was really involved in evangelism. And I thought I was going to be a, a firebrand for Jesus, an evangelist. I was preaching in the jails. I was preaching in the rescue missions. I was finding a pulpit anywhere I could. But the more I realized as I began to talk to people about Jesus, the Lord would always bring to me people that were already saved, that needed to be teached or taught. <laughs> and I began to realize that I'm not an evangelist, <laughs> that I'm a teacher. And that, and it, but it took a while to really, you know, find my place and figure out where I'm at. And that's where a lot of you are at today. You're still trying to figure that out. And I want to tell you this. You know, we have a wonderful group here of people that serve. But one thing I realize, it doesn't matter 
where you think you should be, if you just get in and start serving and get your feet wet, God's going to work all that stuff out in your life. Amen? And then you, begin, you, you enter into a relationship with him where he begins to speak to you in, in relationship to what you're doing, and a little here, a little there, and finally you begin to get an, an unction. You begin to understand, oh, this is who I am. This is who he's created me to be. And so we begin to figure that out. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12 is all about the body of Christ. I'm not going to read it all today. But it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So we're all baptized. We're immersed into the body of Christ whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink of the same Spirit. Amen? So we're all drinking of the same Spirit. And, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not confused. He knows what His commission is, and that's to bring us into the image of Jesus Christ. And so that's a wonderful thing. But before we get too far into what it means to be a functional part of Christ's body, Let's discuss what Jesus went through to give birth to the body. For it to become a multi-membered body. As it stands right now, Jesus is the head and we are the body. You know, in John's gospel, there's an interesting conversation that Jesus has with Philip and Andrew. And it begins in John chapter 12 and verse 20, where it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. Well, let me add something to you. I forgot about one part of that story. We used to have church on Sunday and Thursday, two different services all together. And it was in the midst of the whole Jesus revolution. Lots of hippies were getting saved, and it, it was crazy. It was like revival every, every service. And, and tens and fifteens and twenty people at a time would get saved. And, and in this church, we had three different altar calls after every message. One for people who wanted to get saved. Another call for people who wanted to get baptized. We baptized in every service. And then another call for people who wanted to be Holy Spirit baptized. And we Holy Spirit baptized in every service. Every service, people came out speaking in tongues. Amen? <laughs> and so one, it was on a Thursday evening. I'm sitting in there and, and, you know, enjoying the service. And at the end, we have the altar call. And guess who I see walking down the aisle? The guy I was talking to at work. <laughs> that said, I just want to know Jesus. And, and at that time, I was on, we had it with three follow-up teams, one for salvation, one for water baptism, one for spirit baptism, and salvation, water baptism, and I was the one appointed to him to lead him to the Lord that night. Wow. Talk about God's mercy and his You know, being the witness that happened even after I blew it. God's grace. And so continuing there in John, Jesus said, or John 20, there were certain Greeks among them who came to the feast. And then they came to Philip, who's, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Now, Jesus' response here is really interesting because he points them to the body of Christ, not to himself. But Jesus answered them and saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies it produces much grain. And so he's talking about 
the body of Christ, the harvest that is to come forth from, the seed, from his seed that was planted in the earth. And when that seed grew up, guess what? It wasn't just one seed anymore. It was the harvest. And so Jesus is speaking of the body of Christ that would come forth from his seed as a mighty harvest of souls who would be his servants. And then we find in the next verse, verse 25, it says, he who loves his life will lose it. If we want to be a part of the harvest seed that produces the multiplicity of God's grace and mercy and favor, we have to die. We have to die to ourselves. He says, he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, listen to this. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. You know why his servant is there? Because he's so connected to the head. You know, sometimes we're so unconnected, we don't know where we're supposed to be. And we're not where he wants us to be, where we can help reap in more of the harvest. And so Jesus is talking about the body that is so connected to his head that wherever we are, there he is as well. This is what Jesus meant. Where I am, there my servant will be. And so what God needed, he, I mean, in his son, he had the manifestation of God in the flesh. But there was one problem with that. Jesus was limited by space and time. God needed a vehicle in which that would transcend every generation. Every generation. He needed a vehicle that would transcend all places on the earth. He needed to be where everybody was, not where just one select people were. He needed to be in every tribe and every nation throughout the world. And so he had to reproduce himself through that seed that was buried in the earth to give forth, to give birth to his body, the body of Christ. And that's an amazing thing. Because now, each and every one of us here today are a part of Jesus Christ. We're a part of his body. Some of you are hands, some of you are feet, some of you are fingers. Some of you are parts that are unseen. And those are the most important parts. But whoever you are, you belong to him. And he belongs to you. And so Jesus had to die so that his divine seed could be planted and multiplied to bring forth a more substantial harvest of sons and daughters. His purpose was to bring forth a mini minute body that would be far more glorious than the single expression of his body in the incarnation of the only begotten son. He was the apostle. He was the prophet. He was the pastor, he was the teacher, and he was the evangelist. He was all five of those gifts. He had all of the fruits of the Spirit just flowing and oozing out of his body completely. He was given the Spirit without measure. You see, each one of us has been given a measure of his gifting a measure of his grace, so that when the body is connected together, we can exhibit the full measure in the same way that Jesus exhibited the full measure of God's Spirit. In John 1.14 it says, For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives a spirit without limit or measure. And so well, here's what we have to understand about Jesus. Said Jesus was both fully man and fully God. Even though he was fully man as well as God, he gave up his right 
to act as God and became obedient to the death and dependent upon the Holy Spirit, dependent upon the Father. Jesus says, I don't do anything unless I see what the Father is doing. We are so connected, I do everything that he says for me to do. And so just like he, he showed us what it means to be con so connected to the head that we can function perfectly. You know, here's an amazing thing. You guys want to see something really amazing? Look at this. You see my finger? Look at this. I can twiddle my thumbs. You know what's so amazing about that? I didn't even have to think about it. The signal came from my head to my body. The signal was immediate. It was an immediate signal. And that's how connected God wants us to be to the head who is Jesus Christ. Amen? And so Jesus was given that spirit without measure. It says in Philippians 2, let this mind be in you. I like some other translations. They say, let this attitude be in you. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Some say, that's almost impossible. But with his grace working in us, with his Holy Spirit working in us, conforming us into his image from glory to glory, it's possible. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But here it is. He made himself of no reputation. He says, I don't, I'm not going to, Go down and tell everybody, I'm God. <laughs> I'm not going to act as God. I'm going to be totally reliant upon the Holy Spirit working in me. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of the cross. And so it was in this form that Jesus manifested all of the authority of the Father with the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit as a son of God. He was the body of Christ, fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit working in him. And so as I said before, each of us today has been given a measure of his gifting, a measure of his grace, a measure of his faith. Jesus was perfect in faith throughout his whole ministry. He was perfect in faith. That means whatever he prophesied, will come true. Whatever he prayed will happen. All of those things, because he had perfect faith. Now, all of the gifts that were displayed through his ministry have been given to us as the body of Christ. When the whole body eventually comes together to the place where it functions together in total unity and harmony, we will produce the same full measure that Christ exhibited. Now, when you look at the body of Christ today and you think, man, that's never going to happen. It can't happen. But guess what? God is sovereign. He knows how to make his sovereignty work. He knows how to use vessels unto honor. He knows how to use us to bring us into a place of obedience to where we can get the immediate signal without <laughs> having it interrupted with all of our crazy thoughts that are going on. And so we are the harvest that is being reproduced from his seed that was buried in the earth. Aren't you happy for that? That you're a part of his harvest? You're a part of him who God chose and now he's chosen you to be a part of him as well. Jesus was the anointed one sent by God to reveal God in his majesty, his power, his grace. He showed us the true character of God and what it means to truly love, care, and minister to others as the fruits of the Spirit poured out of his life. He came to show us how to be the body of Christ. He showed us God's incredible power and majesty through the gifts of the Spirit manifested through his life. He revealed to us what, is, what it is to operate in the authority of God. 
through his anointed teaching, casting out demons, speaking with wisdom to those who opposed him. He had all authority. God has given us authority. He says, in fact, I've given you authority to trample all over the face of the devil. To squash him, just like we sang today. Wasn't that what great? I love that song. And so Jesus is undoubtedly the embodiment of God in the flesh who amazingly manifested God's power, his character, his authority to the world in which he came in contact with. He was a man fully submitted to the fullness, and that's the key there. He was a man fully submitted. And that's probably one of the hardest things that we deal with. We don't like to submit. We don't, but we have to. It isn't going to work without submission. We submit to one another in the fear of God. We submit to him as a head. And so as the body of Christ is filled with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, we are to manifest God's character, his power, his authority in all of our places of ministry as we stay connected to the head. And that doesn't mean just when you come to church. If you look at that picture, those people are mostly outside of the church, in their functioning places, their places where they work every day. Those are the places that God wants us to manifest his character, his gifts, his authority, to show people who Christ really looks like. A lot of people have no idea what Jesus looks like because many Christians give him a poor example. They do. They trample all over him. They are not willing to see the authority of the head who is Jesus Christ. And because of that, they have a lousy testimony that really leads them to disbelief. Offense. And so we have to get our lives together, people. We have to get the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives. We have to have the gift of the Spirit working in our lives. Whatever that is in your life. And then we can speak with authority to those who don't believe. Show them what the true light of the God looks like. And so as a body of Christ that is filled with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, we are to manifest his character, his power, his authority in all of our places as we stay connected to the head. And this is why it's so important that we press in. You know, you don't hear that term too much. When I was growing up in the Lord, uh, it, our, our, some of our first conversations with people would be, are you pressing in, brother? Are you pressing in? Yeah, I'm pressing in. <laughs> Amen. We need to understand what it means to press in. Things don't just happen. You have to reach for them. Amen? Amen. You have to struggle for them. It's a struggle. Read Romans chapter 7. Paul had to struggle with the flesh. We have to struggle. But he's gave, given us the power, the Holy Spirit within us to overcome all things. To walk as an overcomer in this life. Ephesians 4, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according, there it is, to the measure of Christ's gifts. In other words, the same way your particular gift was working in Christ, it's now working in you. Whatever your gift is, it's the same way. It isn't just because Jesus was Jesus and he was full of faith that he could do all the things that he did. It's because he was gifted by the Father. And we're gifted by the Father. If anyone asks and seeks and knocks, it says they will be given whatever they ask for. And so you have to hunger for these things. That's one of the things that I realize. If you don't have a hunger, you're not going to get very far. You have to hunger and thirst for more of God. You say, God, I want you. 
I want your, work, your spirit working in me in a mighty way, just like it was in Jesus. I want to feel the anointing. I want to sense the anointing flowing in and out of me in the way that you have, i use the word, programmed me. <laughs> you have set me in the body to do. And so he says, in verse 8, he says, when, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. That was part of his death. That was part of his resurrection. That was his seed being planted so that we could have gifts. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And so the seed of the body had to come forth with power and character and authority as he was planted. He, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now what does that mean? That he might fill all things. We'll try to envision this. Saints all over the world in every nook and cranny, every city, every village, saints who have been moving forward. And all of a sudden, God decides to give a big blow on his body. The bones of Ezekiel beginning to rise as a mighty army. And all of these bones stand up with flesh, joints and ligaments connected to one another, become the fullness of the body of Christ throughout the whole earth. That's in the script that God wrote. And it says, in the next portion, he gave himself, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now my primary gift, as I realize over the years, isn't a pastor although I do work as a pastor sometimes, but my primary gift is that of a teacher, and even more so as a prophetic teacher. I understand a lot about the prophetic and the scriptures that God has given me insight to. That he might fill all things. <laughs> and so in Ephesians 2, it says he's going to fill all in all with his presence. That's an amazing thing that's going to come forth. That the body of Christ in actuality will look and feel and taste just like Jesus himself throughout the earth. Now the next part, or in verse 13, listen to this now. Until when? He gave apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists until when? Until we all come to the unity of the faith. Again, that seems like a far thing to happen. It's not, you know, in our mind, we can't visualize that because the body is so disjointed. You know, I sense here that it's pretty well jointed together in a lot of ways. You know, I, I know we had the funeral a couple of weeks ago for Charlie's wife, and my wife came back and she said, you know, I was so amazed how everybody just jumped in and pitched in and made the work so easy. And that's what it is when we all pitch in and help. You know, we really sense the body flowing together and functioning together in perfect unity. Until we all come to the unity of the no and faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now this is a hard one. To a perfect man to the measure and the stature and the fullness of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't want to bomb out some of your theology here, but I got news for you. Jesus is not coming back today or tomorrow. This has not been fulfilled. It has not been fulfilled. And he says, you're going to need all of these gifts until this happens. Amen? That's what the scriptures, and you can go throughout the Bible and you can see scripture after scripture that verify that. 
And so the next portion of his scripture speaks of his expectations for us as his body. In verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to grow up in our understanding. He wants us to grow up in our understanding of his word, of his truth, that we would not be babes anymore that just need milk, but we would eat the meat of his word. So we would no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried by every wind of doctrine. Do you know in the church today there's every wind of doctrine that you can conceive of that flows through it? And a lot of people are just being swayed by that because they don't know what the truth is. Do you know, you know how people in the banks and whatever spot counterfeit money? They know what the real one looks like. The more you know the real Jesus, you won't be deceived by a false Jesus. Amen? The more you know Christ, the more you know his word, you won't be filled, but you won't be um, torn apart by those who misuse and rest the scriptures. And I tell you today, people all over the place, turn on, you know, just go on the internet or Facebook or anywhere and listen to some of these people. <laughs> it's like, didn't they read the word? <laughs> be careful. We have to be careful in this hour because Satan knows this. He knows how gullible people are. We're all gullible in a sense. We want to believe. But we need to be wise and discerning, especially in this hour, because there are so many deceptive voices in the church. And that's why God has ordained the local church. So you know what's coming forth. You know the people that you're listening to. So what is it then? from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every joint does its share, every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying itself in love. Now, we know now that Jesus was given the Spirit without measure, to adequately express the Father's image and beauty to all who witness his coming, the body of Christ with Jesus as its head will express the fullness of God's beauty and power to all who witness his glory, and then the end shall come. Now, I want to fast forward ahead because we know Jesus, the script has already been written. So let's look at the end of the, let's look at part of the script that's close to the end. And we find that in Joel chapter 2, a picture of Christ's body before he returns. In verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, that's you. For the Lord is great and very awesome, who can endure it? In verse 2, it says, a people come great and strong, like whom has never been. Th this picture here is a picture of his body that's never been seen before on the earth. It's a fully functioning army, so connected to the head, they all move in sync with one another and with the head. He says in verse 3, a fire devours before them. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. You know, I, I could get into a lot of this, but I'm not going to. But I am going to recommend this book. You can get it on Amazon, and whoever wants it can have it. Um, <laughs> but um, this book... <laughs> we got one hungry person here, good. That book is called Prophetic Purposes and the Zeal of the Lord, When Sovereignty Meets Free Will. Because those two have to work together. And God knows how to, how to work with your free will. He knows how to work with his army. 
He says, their appearance is like the appearance of horses, like the steeds they run, like the noise of flaming fire that devours, like people set in battle array. They run like mighty men. Everyone marches in formation. They do not break rank. They all, and this is my idea in here, they all know their positions and anointing in Christ. There's no need to push. There's no need to shove. There's no need to be jealous of one another because everybody knows who they are in Christ. They're all connected to the head equally. They do not push or shove one another. We, we just totally march and call them in sync with his voice as he's speaking to us. They run to and fro in the city. They climb into houses. They enter, widows, in, in, they enter windows like a thief. I used to wonder, what in the world are you talking about there? But you know what? In Acts 3 and verse 21, Jesus, it says Jesus is literally held in heaven until the restoration of all things. What that verse is talking about is that at this point, the body of Christ is breaking in to Satan's domain and taking back everything that the enemy took in the fall. The restoration of all things. Just like Abraham, when he went to get Lot after Lot had captured, he brought back Lot and he recovered all. Just like David, when his family and all their friends and everybody was captured, all their, all their goods and everything, he went and he found where the enemy was camped. He broke in and he recovered everything that was taken from him. And now it's time for us to rise up as men and women of God, the anointed ones of God, and break in to where Satan is at and take back what belongs to us. Yeah. Amen? So how does the seed that was planted through Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection become a harvest of souls? With the many-membered body, fully expressing the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. How do we become functioning members of the body? To where every joint supplies, according to every work, effective working by which every part does its share. And so I want to give you three quick principles here that will help you to strive to become the joint that supplies according to effective working by which every part does its share. And the first point is we must be firmly connected to the head. How do we become functioning members of the body who become so connected to his head that every part does its share. Well, Paul gives us an example in his book, a letter to the Colossians. In Colossians 2.9, for it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Then verse 18 it says, no, let no one cheat you of your reward. Don't let anyone cheat you of what I've just shared with you. Don't let anyone cheat you of the anointing that resides within you by not holding to the head from whom, from whom the, all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. And so Jesus is now the head. We are his body. He is the head that gives signals, just like I shared. My head's given that signal, and I don't even realize it. That's how connected he wants us to be. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and to stay connected, our minds need to be decluttered. How many realize that we have a lot of clutter in our minds? We do. All of this stuff. <laughs> it's like, how does the voice of God get through all of that? Anxiety, self-hatred, fear, pride, performance-driven, and everything else that's up there. You know, an I can't attitude, fear. How do we get through that? 
it takes a, it, it makes it very difficult for the still small voice to penetrate through to direct our steps to what's needed to supply what only our joint can supply for the edification of the body. And so when our minds are cluttered like this, with all of the garbage that we see in this slide, we have too much static. It's like we couldn't hear Sean this morning because there's too much static, right? <laughs> there's too much static to hear God's voice, to be activated, because we're so cluttered. And so we're prevented from being the kind of functional members we would like to be. We're incapable of hearing and receiving the commands coming to our body parts, so the body of Christ becomes dysfunctional. And so to rid ourselves of the static, we must bring every thought into the obedience of Jesus Christ and his word. And I'm constantly doing that, because I understand that that's where the victory is at, is bringing my thoughts in connection with his thoughts. I want your thoughts, Lord. You know why? Because his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His thoughts are better than your thoughts. Your thoughts are all messed up because I have to wade through all that. <laughs> and, we, and, you know, and so, you know, we, we think our thoughts are great. You ever been around somebody that is very opinionated and, and, they, and, and you're talking to them and it's like they are so right and then you point out, well, what about this? What about that? And you realize, they realize, well, oh, I guess I was wrong. But you sure sounded right. <laughs> and, and that's the way some of us are. We can be so right, but we have to be, we have to humble ourselves, amen? We have to humble ourselves so that we can hear, so that we can hear others as well. And how do we do that? 2 Corinthians 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, every thought, into captivity of the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Sometimes we forget about verse 6. You have to obey the first three or four verses before si verse six takes effect. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up like, what is it, the sons of Sekina or whatever they were, <laughs> the demons jumped all over them? We don't want that. But if, our obedience, if, if we're being as obedient as we know how to be, and sometimes that's what it is. It, you know, you're just obedient to what he showed you at that moment or whatever, and you can operate under his authority. And so the next point, we know and follow the voice of God, our chief shepherd. John 10 and verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus, Jesus calls you to be intimate and loving, to an intimate and loving relationship with God to that secret place, the heart where true contact with God takes place. This is what causes us to stay connected and for our heads to be, and minds to be uncluttered. Verse 26. <laughs> we should be like the sheep who know the, vo know the voice of the shepherd rather than the senseless horse or mule whose movement must be controlled by bit and bridle. Psalm 32.9 don't be like the senseless horse or mule whose movement must be controlled with a bit and bridle. How many have ever been the mule? <laughs> oh, come on, I know all of you have. <laughs> how, many, how many know it's no fun being the mule? <laughs> you know what happens to people who have a mule attitude? They get trials and tribulations. <laughs> you know why? Because God wants to humble you and test you and find out what's really in your heart. And, and Peter says, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And so a lot, and that doesn't mean we're not going to go through stuff. We will. But a lot of the stuff we go through is just because of our stubbornness and our disobedience. And we reap what we sow. And so let's be like the shepherd and the sheep who hear his voice. And then lastly, we must embrace belonging to God 
unto one another. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, when I think of how perfectly this human body is put together, how, how can you not believe in God? You know, where every part just knows what to do, functions, and, you know, the head gives us signals and everything. And then it gives me faith <laughs> to believe that the body can actually function like that. And so all of the elements of my human body belong to each other. Each part is a necessary part of the whole to make it function how God created it. And when part of my body is hurt or wounded, guess what? My whole body is suffering. And, and, and that's why we need the different gifts, the gifts of mercy and so on, you know, that people are able to sense, you know, what's wrong with others so that we can minister effectively. I was going to read 1 Corinthians 12, but, you know, it's talking about, you know, one's a foot, one's a hand, and so on. We're all part of the whole. But every part is needed to belong to Jesus and to one another. And every part needs to be connected through our relationship to Jesus as the head. We are not our own. Guess what? You are not your own. Jesus bought you and paid a heavy price for you. And he owns you. Romans 12, 5. So in Christ, we who are many members form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I belong to you. You belong to me. You know, if, if we could just get that revelation into our psyche, it would change us, how we relate to one another. Because we all, knowing that if I hurt you, I'm hurting myself. It's true. And so we need to be kind. You know, I, wa I once um, asked my home group, we were talking about the gifts of the Spirit, I, the fruit of the Spirit. I says, what fruit of the Spirit do you display the most? And they said this or that. And then, then I said, what fruit of the Spirit do you like other people to display towards you? And it was almost an overwhelming, yes, kindness. But you know what was interesting? Nobody mentioned kindness when I asked the first question. Isn't that something? We all need kindness. We need to be kind to one another. And so it's very difficult to belong to one another. And my last point here is this. Community groups is where we stay connected to right. Jesus. You can't, you can't stay connected in this type of a setting. This setting is important, but community groups are far more important because that's where you work out all of this stuff with each other. That's where you learn to belong to one another, where you're not your own. That when somebody's suffering in your community group, guess what? You feel it because you're right there. When somebody's suffering here, you may not even ever know about it. And that's probably the truth. But when you're in a close-knit group of people, you know, and you feel, and you want to do something about it, even if it costs you something. And so it's very difficult to belong to one another and stay connected without experiencing community through small groups. In all actuality, this is where we learn to be the body of Christ that functions together in unity and harmony. And this is the kind of connection that God wants us to experience with Jesus as our spiritual head. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we come to you today. Just place your hand on your heart. God, I pray today for each and every one of us here that we would all understand and know what it means to be a part of your body and how important of a calling that is. God, that we would take that seriously and just submit our lives to your authority, to what you've called us to do, that we would eagerly seek that position, that gift, that grace, your mercy, and all that you have to fill us, Lord. We would seek that with hungry hearts to belong to one another, to belong to you, and stay connected to your head. 
we pray this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.